All I want to do is bottle some of the passion of voice felt toward Chicago, pass it on to you guys, let you know why I and nearly three million other people call this place home. We're going to break that question down into three categories, starting with our beautiful architecture, then we're going to cover some of our history here in Chicago, and most importantly, we've got a very unique culture that welcomes you all to take part in. So I'm going to give you plenty of other recommendations throughout the tour, things to eat, see, do, drink. So by the end of our tour, no one should know the difference between you and a local. For the next 75 minutes, you're all Chicagoans in training. Which means you got a lot to get to. So let's get into it. And we'll start with this white building in front of us, Clock Tower on top, the Wrigley Building. It is built with revivalist style architecture, a popular style from the 1880s to the early 1920s, just following the Great Chicago Fire. We're starting to rebuild, and want to prove to the rest of the world we're just as beautiful as any place else. We just don't have our own style of architecture yet. So we copy what Europe's doing, and we paste it right here in Chicago. This is based off a cathedral you can still find in Sevilla, Spain. So again, that's Spanish revivalism, to get specific. Uh, and it's a very beautiful building, but it's not an original design. We're getting them from Europe and we're pasting them here. Fast forward to modern day, architecturally, we do the exact opposite. We're all about site-specific design called contextualism. These buildings factor in the context of their environment and actually incorporate it into design, which means you can't copy and paste anymore. Even if you try and put it someplace else in Chicago, it's not gonna work quite the same. And a great example of contextualism is right in front of us, our second tallest building, Trump International Hotel and Tower. Now you can notice there are three terraces or setbacks going up. They match the height of the surrounding buildings. So that first terrace matches the height of the Wrigley Building right next door. It mirrors its direct neighbor. That second terrace matches the Mather Tower, which is the white telescope building across the river from it. And the third terrace matches the building just beyond it on the river. It's a giant black box called the AMA building. But it doesn't just match building height. It also matches building tone. Again, it's sandwiched between the all-white Wrigley building, the all-black AMA building. So this bluish-grayish glass creates a transitional element between the two. It blends all of its surroundings together into a single design, which is why it doesn't work the same if you drag and drop it anywhere else in Chicago. It's collaborating with its neighbors, which means it only works in this particular site. That's the beauty of contextualist design. And we'll break down a few other contextualist buildings later on the tour so you get an idea of what that feels like other places throughout the city too. Now if you are like me, and by the end of this tour, you do want to sign a lease, I actually have a recommendation on where you might want to do it. Coming up in just a moment, one of the more affordable spots downtown. For a studio or one bedroom, all the listings inside go for $1,300 to $2,000 a month. Which may not sound cheap depending on where you're from, but for downtown Chicago with a river view, you probably won't find a better deal. And you probably recognize these buildings anyway. They're coming up on the right. Two large corn cob buildings. Marina City Towers. Iconic apartments from the 60s. And when they were built in the 60s, not a lot of apartments downtown. So these are also self-sustainable buildings. A city within a city. If you head inside, you could still find a fully functional grocery and liquor store, movie theater, bowling alley, swimming pool. The parking is on the lower levels. There are restaurants beneath that. And following this bridge, you can also see where it gets its name. It's attached to an actual functional marina. You can park your boat there too. You can access all of those from the building without changing out of your pajamas. It's an introvert's dream. You can also get a better view of the parking on the lower levels here. Cars have only come out the backside twice. Don't worry, both intentional. One was a Steve McQueen movie called The Hunter. Another was an Allstate commercial. Replicated this stunt a few years ago but it is somebody's job to valet park those cars. So if you ever feel like your job is stressful, just remember that, it could always be worse. Left-hand side, we got a small concrete building with 5-5 five five at the top, 5-5 five five West Wacker. We call it the Danny DeVito building because it's short, stubby in between those supermodels. It is a brutalist building, which doesn't have to do with its brutal boxy appearance like you might think. It's actually the material it's made of. Brutalism comes from the French term beton brut which means raw concrete. So again, the rough unfinished material it's made with is the giveaway, not that brutal boxy design like you might think. Supermodel next to it's a sleek glass building. If you dry your eyes up to the top, you can see what looks like the Parthenon up there. It's got the traditional pediment, which is that triangle design you'll find above Greek and Roman temples. This is a neoclassical design from the 1990s. Again, still barring European aesthetics from the past, like in revivalism, 
But nowadays, instead of copying and pasting our design straight up like the Wrigley Building, we create remixes. We take old forms of architecture, improve them with new technology, see what you get in the modern era. It's like sampling an old song and making a new one. That's what we're doing architecturally now, too. Also to the left is our Riverwalk, which is a fairly new addition in Chicago. Phase 3 finished in 2016. It cost $112 million. It added splash to grab a bite to eat or drink, an amphitheater here to catch some free shows or free tidbits of architecture boat tours. There are spots to go fishing, spots to dip your kayak in, but my favorite addition with the Riverwalk was actually a fish hotel. It sounds weird, but we added a spot where fish species can hide from predators and boats, and since the 70s, 60 more species of fish have come to the Chicago River. So it's actually doing its job, helping us repair the ecosystem and establish a better relationship to these waterways. Very important. So we've unfortunately neglected them ever since the beginning of our city. We've used them for transportation, trade, even sewage at one point in time. So never quite had the relationship with them we're trying to build now. Which is ironic because we owe most of our success to them. We've got 20% of the world's liquid fresh water in the Great Lakes system behind us, which is very convenient connection to the Midwest, East Coast, even Canada. And the Chicago River eventually connects all the way down to the Mississippi and the Gulf of Mexico. So this was the spot to meet up and do trade back in the day. That's how we first got our start. In fact, even the name Chicago comes from these waterways in a roundabout way. It comes from the Potawatomi word weed. It's a type of onion which grew along our riverbanks before there was a city. So, New York's the Big Apple. Here in Chicago, we are literally the Little Stinky Onion. That's where we get our name from, 100% true. So, very humble beginnings is the Little Stinky Onion, but again, we owe most of our success to these waterways, which is why I'm trying to treat them with more respect now. On the right-hand side here, another cool style of architecture. It's what came after revivalism in the mid-1920s. This is Merchandise Mart, a great example of Art Deco-style architecture. It's got this sturdy Indiana limestone and space material, all about streamlined verticality. Draws your eyes upward, makes the building seem even bigger than it actually is. Every Art Deco building is competing for your attention, trying to be the biggest and best in the block. Draw your attention in, away from its other competitors. In fact, you can even see the gold ornamentation, those diamonds above the windows up there. That's the glitz and glam of the Roaring Twenties, coming out in building form. Think Great Gatsby. That's what Art Deco buildings always tend to embody. We'll talk a little bit more about the history behind Art Deco and of several other styles a little bit later on the tour. But first, we want to get those cameras up. On the opposite side of Franklin Street Bridge, we get a beautiful trophy case of contextual style architecture at Wolf Point, where the three branches meet. And it's a beautiful shot. I'll give you a moment to really take this in. Now, first building here I want to point out is on the left. We got a curved glass building, the new Vian building. This was Ferris Bueller's dad's office from Ferris Bueller's day off. But the curve of that building matches the curve of the river, and so does that greenish bluish tint. So again, pays tribute to what's around it. That's contextualism too. We got another contextualist building in front of us. A giant stick of deodorant. A McDonald's apple pie. A hot pocket. Take your pick, any one of those. That's River Point. Curved entrance and top. Reflects the curve of the river that we're making to the right here. And our last contextualist building is that Y-shaped one on the left. 150 North Riverside. Now the Y pays tribute to where we are because Wolf Point, where the three branches of the river meet, literally makes a giant Y if you look at a map of Chicago. This was our first neighborhood. First taverns, hotels, ferries, all cropped up right here. So we owe a lot to Wolf Point and pay tribute to it in our designs. It's actually kind of a fun where's wall though. If you pay attention to Ys, you'll find them hidden all throughout our city. And if you want an idea of what you're looking for, on the right, nearly every other fence is a circle with a Y in it, in the fence. So again, if you keep an eye out for these Y designs, you'll find them hidden all throughout our city, just like the fencing there. And it's all thanks to Wolf Point in our first neighborhood. Also coming into view around the bend is a bridge suspended over the river. The Carolab Railway Bridge. Used to allow trains to and from the neighborhoods here. Nowadays, it only comes down once a year just to make sure it still works. It's designated a landmark in 1997. But we still have 37 movable bridges here in Chicago. That's the most in the U.S. Second most in the world behind Amsterdam, actually. And our bridges are known all throughout the world, too. They're called Chicago style, double leaf, trunnion basket bridges. There's a lot there. 
Double leaf means they open in two parts, separating from the middle. This bridge in front of us here is a single leaf bridge. It operates in one giant part instead of split in the middle in two. So it's a little bit different than our typical bridge. Trunnion means attached to the axles on the riverbanks. It describes the relationship of these bridges to the river. And bascule literally means seesaw or teeter totter. It's the method we use to move them. On this bridge, you may be able to notice there's a giant concrete slab that's hanging off the back. It'll be especially apparent as we go a little bit closer. That's the counterweight that's required to move this bridge up and down. It is three times the weight of the bridge itself. That's true of all of our bridges. You just don't normally see them because they're in our bridge houses, which are those ornate structures next to bridges that typically house the counterweight. Weight goes down, bridge comes up. But again, this one wears it on its sleeves to get an idea of just how much weight we need to move. So imagine three times the weight of 37 of our bridges downtown. That's how much weight we need to make sure boats can still get through the Mississippi to this day. And if you want to know more about bridges than I know off the top of my head, there's actually a bridge house museum on Michigan Ave, right where we end the tour. You can go in and see how the gears turn yourself, learn a little bit more about bridges, and typically it's free on Sundays. So if you happen to stay through the weekend, you're looking for something fun and free to do on the weekend, again, check out that bridge house museum on Michigan Ave on Sunday. Might be worth doing. Also worth mentioning, these bridges are uniform in style. They got Bordeaux, that's the color of them. It's two parts black, one part red. And they look old, but that's not always the case. Again, one of the bridges that we passed under looks just as old as all the other bridges, but it was actually built nine years ago. It was built to look old, and again, match that uniform style. Harry Weiss in 1988. It's postmodernism style architecture, which is fun and playful design from the 1980s. The uh, fun and playful element of these, they've got porthole windows and triangle designs, which are a nod to the boats and their sails you can find around here. But it's not just clever design, it's also revolutionary. Because if you'll notice, a big part of the river cottages is they face the river. And in the 80s, it was a very dirty river. You didn't want to do that. Our conservation efforts are a lot more recent than that. So this was starting to change your idea of how we should be treating the river as early as the 80s. And again, river cottage is very influential in that way. It's also more affordable downtown real estate. If you want to live there, just need about $2 million a pop. A couple openings too, so I want to jump on that. And if that's not an issue for you, you might also want to check out the gym that we'll see on the right-hand side just following this bridge. It's the East Bank Club. All sorts of famous folks have worked out inside. People like Jesse Jackson, Billie Jean King, Michael Jordan, even Oprah and Obama have worked out in this gym. If you want to work out yourself, you just need $500 for the activation fee and about $250 a month after that. Okay, no big deal. Now, we're going to make a U-turn here, head down the South Branch, where there's more fun things to see, do, and talk about. In the meantime, it is an ideal moment to use the restrooms if you have to. Pay uh, Ray a visit at the bar for a refreshment, or ask me a question. I'll be coming around in just a moment to make sure you can hear all right. During that time, if you have any questions, and if you know, just say, hey, Jack, flag me down. I'd be happy to answer them. And when we head down the South Branch, we got a lot of history to cover some different styles of architecture, and some of Chicago's main historical characters and events too. So, a lot more to come. Stay tuned. Chicago-style food options later on the tour in a little more depth, but Portillo's has Chicago-style hot dogs, Italian beef sandwiches, and something called a chocolate cake shake. It's a piece of chocolate cake makes you lunch up. It's fantastic. Just make sure you got enough time for a nap. Where you go. Now back to Wolf Point here. Some other things to note. You may notice on the right we got some circles that run the whole area. These are fans, keeping air circulating and the train tracks beneath that run to and from our suburbs. But that means the buildings here have to purchase air construction rights from the railway, which is the right to build, lease, and construct over track. These railways sell them for $1.3 million a year, for 99 years. So it's very expensive and restrictive to lease over here, and if you're building, you got to get clever with those designs to avoid those train tracks. 
which is another reason 150 North Riverside shaped like a Y. It's sandwiched between the Chicago Riverwalk on one end and active Amtrak trains on the other. So we can only use 20% of its lot space at its base. Because of that, this lot sat vacant for over 80 years. It's prime real estate downtown. We just didn't know what to do with it. Because until recently, when technology allowed you to make a Y-shaped building, you're missing out on most of your space. But that Y shape means this building has a structural difficulty that a lot of our taller buildings here in the city do, and that is called sway. Oh, we got a great picture in front of us there, real quick. Snag that one if you see it. It's one of our best scrapbook shots. But this building is affected by sway, and that's what a lot of our taller buildings are affected by. And it has to do with our lake effect wind. Again, we're the windy city, we get a lot of it, and our taller buildings are literally built to sway in the wind. We're going to talk about three methods of sway reduction on the tour that buildings use to cut back the sway they experience. What 150 North Riverside uses is called inertial slosh dampers. Inside this building towards the top are 12 massive concrete tanks filled with 160,000 gallons of water. When it gets hit with a gust of wind, the water in those tanks sloshes the opposite way. So it creates a natural counterbalance to any sway it gets and holds a little more place. It's a very cool but confusing modern method of sway reduction. So we'll talk about two more before the end of the tour. This building though, is also a great example of what contemporary style buildings look like, which is the style of buildings we're making now. A great timestamp for where we're at now. Because on this next portion of the tour, we're going back in time. We're talking about how Chicago's architecture has evolved alongside history. Again, following the fire in the 1880s, we begin rebuilding with revivalism, copying and pasting European designs, like the Wrigley Building. That takes us up to the mid-1920s, when we switch over to Art Deco style. Another example on the right, the Passade Plaza, the old Daily News building. When we're building these in the Roaring Twenties, we're looking optimistically to the future, pouring all our money into buildings to be the biggest and best, because life is good. What could possibly go wrong? i give you an idea of what went wrong. Left-hand side, Civic Opera Building, opened two weeks after the stock market crashed in 1929. Only made it for about three years before it went bankrupt. So, the Great Depression comes along and cuts short the Art Deco era. And shortly following the Great Depression comes World War II. So there's a big break in building from the 1930s to the 50s. When we come back to building after the war, buildings look a lot different than Art Deco. Coming up on the right, two large black steel boxes. Modernist buildings from the 1950s. After World War II, there's a big return to the workforce, so we need office buildings quick to accommodate that surge. At the same time, the war effort was expensive, so these gotta be cheap too. Mies van der Rohe champions this style, and takes architecture back to its three most basic building blocks. Skeleton, skin, and space. That's all you need. The skeleton is the steel aluminum frame that hold these buildings up. These are office buildings, so they're all business. They're not trying to wow you in the same way Art Deco buildings do. Their only concern is being an office building. So, they can ditch all the ornamentation, get back to basics. It's not necessary. The skin is the floor-to-ceiling windows, and the space are the plazas that surround each and every one. Now again, these are very functional buildings. They get the job done. But they're also quite sterile. Not very human. So to humanize them, we keep those plazas as a spot where you can enjoy your lunch, be around nature, and feel like more than just a cog in the machine. That's the psychological effect of space. There's no agenda behind it. It allows room for you to exist as you are, which is very necessary when you work in a giant black sterile box. You need that room for you too. And also, no matter where you put them, they stick out. They don't quite belong. And so eventually this style of architecture slowly softens and becomes a style that belongs anywhere in the world. International style. Ahead on the right, that white box building that also may look like a building for your own hometown. In the 1970s, that was the international style, which means you can pull it out of most places in the world. They still look very similar. Boxy shapes, plazas, lack ornamentation. They're your typical no-frills office buildings. The biggest change isn't on the outside. It's the mentality behind each style, why we're making them. We're no longer making quick and cheap buildings after World War II at the cost of fitting in. We are now actively trying to fit in with a global scheme of architecture. In fact, we're going out of our way to do what everybody else is doing. Now that desire to fit in continues into the 1980s, which is when contextualism starts to take off. 
And if you're not careful, all these different styles of architecture will make your city feel like a random collection of buildings that's competing for your attention instead of a more intentional city or neighborhood. You lose sight of the big picture of the city when you only think about your particular building. And so contextual buildings, like the one ahead, another curved glass building, are instead team players. They sacrifice their own identity to collaborate with their neighbors instead of compete. They're community oriented, which means the shapes of the buildings, the shape of the glass, the setbacks, all reflect what's around it. No two look the same, because no two spots in the city are the same either. They blend all the styles of architecture together, and as a result, create much more intentional collaborative neighborhoods. Otherwise, your city might just feel like random buildings. That's why it's some of my favorite architecture. It's very intentional. It pulls together the big picture of the city. It's also still alive and well today as an architectural style. But contemporary style architecture is not just about tech advancements. It's using that tech to create a remix, like the neoclassical building we saw, or this remix we're about to see on the left. This is a modernist building, added a you are here map to the sign 2014. Following the bridge you can look up, see that red box sticking out the sign? That's where we are on the river. And as we head a little bit further, you might be able to draw your eyes even further up and see the literal Chicago Y of Wolf Point. Yeah, it really does make a Y if you look at a map like that. And another remix is coming up here on the right. Art Deco style building, the old main <laughs> post office. And the opening sequence of The Dark Knight, Joker zip lines onto the roof of this building, robs a bank, drives a bus through the side of it, getting away with the cash. But we actually used to get our mail there. Nowadays, it's just offices. We went a $900 million renovation a few years ago. And with all that money comes a very cool addition. Largest private rooftop garden in the world. It's 3.5 acres of space called the Meadow. It comes complete with walking trails, basketball and pickleball courts, a bistro bar, local plant species, all on the roof of that building. It's unfortunately private, so you gotta work there or know someone who does to get out there. But if you know somebody, come find me. I'm still working on my connection. But it does make it a green building. It's LEED certified, which stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. It's another big facet of modern architecture. It's not just about playing nice with your neighbors, but also with the environment. And here in Chicago, we have more LEED certified buildings than any other city in the U.S. We're quite literally leading America's Green Charge may not be aware of. But that catches up to modern day from an architecture lens. We're going to go back in time once more, talk about how we got here, some of the influential characters events of Chicago's past that have shaped us into who we are today. And we'll start those stories October 8th, 1871. It's a Sunday night, 9 p.m., quiet night in Chicago, until suddenly, Four blocks to the right of where we are now, a fire breaks out for an unknown reason at the O'Leary Ranch. Over the next three days, 32 hours, this fire slowly spreads, consumes everything we can see on our tour, destroys 3.5 square miles in the downtown area. It renders a third of our population, 100,000 people at that time, homeless, and causes an estimated $4 billion in modern day damages. This is the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. Still, largest urban fire in history. How'd the fire start? We're looking for a scapegoat. In this case, a scape cow. Mrs. O'Leary's cow takes the blame. Supposedly, she leaves the lanch in the barn with her cow, goes to bed for the night, cow kicks the lanch and over, spreads into the Great Chicago Fire. You may have already heard this one. However, it's not true. It's just a rumor that got out of control. You might say, it's a full-blown cowspiracy. No? I've been looking for a joke or two, you know? Yeah, Joe gets it. Thank you. <laughs> now again, Chicago Tribune reporter who claimed that was true, on his deathbed 1893 admits, he made it up. It's just a lie. Still, it's a catchy lie. Keeps getting passed down. And Mrs. O'Leary wasn't fully exonerated until 1997. Well over a hundred years after he admits he lied and long after she's gone. But nowadays we know it wasn't the cow. If it wasn't the cow, who was it? We actually weren't the only city on fire October 8, 1871. There was a series of little fires burning all across the Midwest. We know a lot of those fires were caused, believe it or not, because of a meteor shower. Bits of rock fall from space to earth catch the ground on fire. Now, since it happened at the same time, we're so close as other places, we figure our fire could have also been a meteor shower incident. But we don't know for sure. 
That's just our best guess. We'll probably never know for certain what truly caused the Great Chicago Fire. But it's not just a mystery and a travesty, it's also an opportunity. Chicago is now this blank slate just waiting to be rebuilt. The first city burnt to the ground. Now the second city can rise from the ashes. And that's where we get our nickname from. It's not because we're second to New York or LA like everyone assumes. It's because the whole first city burnt down and we gotta rebuild it. Architects from all over flood here to help us build that second city. The architect leading the charge is Daniel Burnham. He's got a great quote I love. He says, make no small plans for they have no magic to stir men's blood. Instead, make big plans, aim high and hope and work. That's exactly what he does. He aims high and with Burnham's help in 22 years, we're able to rebuild our city big enough to support one of the largest and most influential world's fairs in American history. It's the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition. We hold that to the south of Jackson Park where the Museum of Science and Industry is. And in six short months, 27 million people from all around the world come through the turnstiles. So it puts Chicago back on the map and also gives us our second nickname. We're in a very contentious battle with our older brother, New York, about who should hold that World's Fair. New York's winning it first. Then Chicago pulls ahead. Then New York again. In the last 24 hours, Chicago pulls ahead, seals the deal. New York's not happy. They say we brag about our city so much, all the hot air from our mouths is making us the windy city. Yeah, you guys thought the cow jokes were bad. That's 10 times worse, come on. Now, Daniel Burns doesn't let that stop him. He keeps building. And by the time we reach 1909, he releases the Burnham Plan. It's an urban city plan that lays the groundwork for Chicago. He calls us the Paris on the Prairie. He promises to live up to our motto, herbs and orto, which means city in a garden. Fast forward to modern day, there's over 600 public parks in Chicago. 19 miles of lakefront trail and 24 public beaches. If you can't look at another major city you've been to, you can't pick up your own. U-turn here in just a moment by the old Beacon Station power plant. As we do, it's another ideal moment to use the restrooms downstairs if you have to. Hey, Ray, a visit for home and refreshment, or ask me a question. If you come around again, you can answer any questions you have. Say, hey, Jack, flag me down. We get a quick parallel if you have one. And when we head back up to South Branch in just a moment, we'll talk about some of the cultural things we're going to do. We're going to have some mission apps, food options, shows, all that fun stuff. It's my favorite part of the buildings would be smaller than it, so he didn't bother carving a face into a statue, no one's going to get close enough to see. Fun story? Not true. The real reason that statue doesn't have a face is because that's not the style of Art Deco. For example, think of the Oscar statue. Now imagine how creepy that guy would look with a face. Yeah, they leave it blank intentionally. That's the aesthetic choice of Art Deco. But still a cool fact it's a face of the statue. And if you go up in the Scottic, we'll talk about in just a moment, you can clearly tell it doesn't have one. So you can also verify that bit of information yourself. And the Scottic is in our tallest building, that black building with white antenna on top, the king of the skyline, the Sears Tower. Now, first thing you gotta mention, it's not officially called the Sears anymore, I know. Its real name is the Willis. Had a name changed 2009 when the Willis Group bought it, but not a single Chicagoan calls it that. If you ask for directions to the Willis Tower, to dig away your tourist. You're not a tourist, you're Chicagoan in training. So no matter what the name gets changed to, it will always be the Sears here in Chicago. You gotta embody that Chicago stubbornness if you wanna fit in with the locals here. And the reason that we're stubborn, when it was built in 1974, that was the tallest building in the world. Held that record for 23 years, all the way up into the 90s. Nowadays, just the third tallest in the US. Although, that's a bit of a controversy. It comes down to how we count building height. From the lowest entrance to the architectural tip, you can manipulate both of those numbers. For example, Trump Tower adds about 50 feet to its height because its entrance is all the way down on the river walk instead of ground level where most people enter. So again, it adds a little bit to its height that way. 
The other term that's tricky is architectural tip. If you have any usable technology on your antennas, Wi-Fi, radio, cell signals, they don't count anymore. Which means the official height of the Sears Tower is now 1,451 feet to the roof. You count the antenna like we used to for most of its reign, that's another 300 feet. Again, they would also count if they didn't have that usable technology. It would be considered a spire, and it would count. Which means we're the third tallest when we probably should be the second. Unfortunately, it's not how it works. So, we're not too mad about that. We're still top three. We'll take that. We do have my favorite photo coming up on the right hand side. I had this framed on my wall after that tour 13 years ago. So I recommend you snag it on a beautiful sky day like today. And it is a fantastic shot. And from this angle, you can also see the stair step look at this year's tower as it goes up, which is actually our second method of producing the sway of your building. It's called a bundled tube design. The two guys that designed it, Bruce Graham and Fosler Khan, sat down to talk about what it should look like. They were in a diner, so no pencil or paper. Instead, they pulled out Bruce Graham cigarettes. They pulled out nine of those cigarettes, bundled them together, placed them all different heights, and that's what they went with. It's nine structures, like the nine cigarettes. Top two sway the most in the wind, other seven bundle together and hold it in place. So it sways as a unit, but it doesn't go anywhere. I also say that as a warning, because if you choose to go up in the sky deck, you'll probably feel the building move. On a normal day, average sway is six inches, which you can expect any day you go. But on our windiest day, Sears Tower can sway up to 18 inches any direction, a total of three feet. So you might feel a move. Keep in mind it's built that way. No need to freak out too much, anyway. It is our tallest observation deck. If you head up there, you're over a thousand feet in the air. You can see four states, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin. And if you're a brave soul, you can also choose to go out on those glass boxes attached to the side called the ledge. There are five now. Keep in mind, even with a crack in the glass, these can support the weight of multiple elephants. So if you do head up there, you got nothing to worry about. But you also got nothing to prove. Keep that in mind too. If you look up in just a moment, you can actually see the undersides of people's feet in those glass boxes. That's the ledge. An add-on to the sky deck, which means you can do the sky deck without doing the ledge. Keep that in mind too. Now, some people ask which is better. The sky deck from the Sears, or well, the 360 from the Hancock are two main observation decks. We're gonna break both down so you can make the best decision for your own preference while you're here. The sky deck here is the tallest and furthest removed from the city, which means every building you're looking for is out one side. If you're going for the nice condensed skyline photo, sky deck's the better option. But that also means out the three sides that don't have the skyline, it's not a whole lot to see. It's kind of boring. The Hancock building's more centrally downtown which means you don't get that one unified skyline view at any side, but you do see something interesting out each and every side. So if you want to see more of Chicago, you can see more from the 360. Those are your trade-offs. Personally, I like the 360 a little bit more. Also from the 360, you don't get those glass boxes called the ledge, you get a row of windows called the tilt. You stand looking outside of those windows, they hydraulically tilt you 30 degrees looking towards the ground. It's less than two minutes long, if you're afraid of heights, it's not too bad. I'm afraid of heights, I did it. Never doing it again, but I did it. And if you're looking for the craziest thing you can do in our city, it tilts my vote for sure. But some people prefer a nice relaxing night with some food and some drink instead of an adrenaline rush. And if that's more your speed too, here's some insider info. On the 95th and 96th floor of the Hancock building, above the observation deck, is the signature room and lounge, a restaurant and a bar. With reservations, you go up, get the same view you'd get from the observation deck. You're not paying just for it. Grabbing a bite to eat, something to drink. Two birds, one stone. And the women's restroom on the 96th floor has a window with the best view of Chicago you can get. Allegedly, anyway. Men's bathroom has a brick wall instead. So, sorry fellas, not quite the same. But in the main eating area, you'll get the same view. Might be worth taking advantage of. Now, if you want to see any of those neighborhoods I recommend, or plenty more, you probably want to take our public transportation to do it. It is called the L, short for Elevated Train Track. That track comes together on the right to make a giant loop. The neighborhood here is called the Loop. It's hard to miss. That makes it our central hub city. The Loop will have a train that'll get you somewhere close. And if you need specific train recommendations and directions, I can help with that too. Come find me. Now, the Loop here also has a good theater district for musicals and shows. 
like the Civic Opera building in front of us there. Only problem is, zero nightlife in the loop. This is where most of our offices are, so after 5 o'clock, the loop is pretty abandoned. I recommend instead, you do want to see a show, hop on the Brown Line here, and up to Old Town and see a Chicago improv show. It's what we're known for. The art of creating comedy on the spot. The famous institution in Old Town is the Second City. All sorts of hilarious alumni come from there with names you probably recognize. Bill Murray, Tina Fey, Chris Farley, Stephen Colbert, Amy Poehler, Jason Sudeikis, me. We're not all Bill Murray, but shows are happening nightly, and last call up there is 4 o'clock in the morning. So if you want a nightlife, Old Town's one of the best neighborhoods to check out. You can get food or drink after a show, or skip the show and just get food or drink. In fact, Chicago-style food is the main thing everyone can and should do in our city, so I'm going to break down some of your different options on this next portion of the tour. We'll start late, or as late as it gets in Chicago with a snack. Chicago-style popcorn. It's cheesy popcorn mixing with caramel corn. Like most Chicago-style things, doesn't sound good. It's not good. It's fantastic. The place to go is Garrett's. It's a franchise, multiple spots. You're gonna smell it a couple blocks out. So just follow your nose, trust it, get you some Garrett's. It's one a block away from where we end the tour. If you're asking about deep dish, you ask 10 of Chicagoans who's got the best, you get 10 different answers. So here's my personal, unofficial opinion, opinion pardon me. If you like sauce, Luminatis. If you like cheese, Giordano's. If you like sausage, Pisano's, you can go to Gino's East, but I haven't personally figured out why you would. There's also Pizzeria Uno, which invented deep dish in River North. That's a 10 minute walk from where we end the tour. There's also Pizzeria Due, same recipe, different location, a block away. Either one works. And since you guys are my favorite tour of the day so far, and there's not many people on board, I'll give you one last bit of insider info. The best deep dish in the city, one location on North Dyborn Street, Pequod's Pizza. It's burnt cheese instead of crust. If you're not sold on deep dish, it'll sell you. It's the way deep dish was meant to be made. The main thing I ask, don't run and tell everybody that. I like my lines nice and short, which is why I don't say it on packed tours, but you guys have earned it. Now, no matter where you're getting deep dish from, it's gonna take 45 minutes when you order it to come out the oven. It's a very long process to make, so if you're already hungry, go with one of these other two options. First, a Chicago-style hot dog. It doesn't matter where you go for these, they're all made the same. It's the opposite of deep dish. Put a lot of ingredients on there. Tomatoes, onions, pickles, peppers, celery salt, relish. But there's one thing you never find in a Chicago dog. Anyone know? Ketchup, you got it. Mustard only in the city. You put ketchup on your hot dog, that's a misdemeanor. Take that seriously. So I brought down Al Capone back in the day. Mustard works better anyway, try it that way. But my favorite Chicago delicacy, by far, is an Italian beef sandwich. You cook shredded beef in a crock pot, put it on a sandwich. Dip the sandwich then back into the crock pot. You can put mild, sweet, or hot peppers on there. Put the mozzarella cheese on mine so it's nice and melting. Oof. Getting hungry talking about it. Place to go, Rico Benny's, Chinatown. Best of time beef sandwich in the city. If you're looking for something more downtown, there's Luke's on Jackson outside the Sears Tower. Personal favorite of mine. They got good hot dogs there too. And the franchises for an Italian beef, multiple spots throughout the city, are Al's and Portillo's. You can get a good Italian beef at either. And again, Portillo's is a 10-minute walk from where we are on the tour. Not just uh, Italian beef sandwiches, but also Chicago-style hot dogs and that chocolate cake shake, too. But no matter where you go or what you eat, the main thing you want to keep in mind when you visit Chicago is this. If you visit our city and you don't gain at least five pounds while you're here, you're not eating Chicago-style food right. So, pick up some stretchy pants on the Magnificent Mile and try some Chicago-style food. It's worth every pound you're going to gain while you visit, I promise. And if you're hungry for something that I didn't mention, steak, seafood, Italian, whatever it is, I might have a recommendation for that too. So, come find me after the tour, and I can point to the right way, whatever you're feeling. Now, back to Wolf Point for the final time. And again, merchandise part in front of us there. We talked about the Art Deco style of it, didn't talk about how massive it is. When this was built in the late 1920s, largest building in the world. It's got 73 football fields of just office space inside. 7.5 miles of hallway. This building's so big, up until 2008, it had its own zip code. The Pentagon is one of the only other buildings to share that fact. Now, there's not much reason to actually head inside. This is wholesale goods. So it's where other stores go to restock their own inventory. Again, if you go in, 
mostly probably just get lost. The main thing that it's worth doing, if you come back to the outside of the park at 8.30 any night, you can catch the largest permanent digital art projection in the world for free. We treat all 2.5 acres of this side of the building as a giant projector screen, projecting moving images and shows onto the side. It's called Art on the Mars. It just picked up in April and will go all the way through December. In fact, one of my favorite shows happened in December. It's the Joffrey Ballet Nutcracker, synced up to music, projected on the side. We do it every year. This time of year, we got some cool public art from our school systems being projected on the side, as well as some local artists. It's all made possible by 34 different 4K projectors. That gray box there, that's our $8 million art on the projection system. That's what makes it possible. And again, it's 8.30 any night. It's a free show. Just come back to the River Walk or Wacker Drive above it. And also, the nightlife that I mentioned in River North is just on the other side of Merchandise Road, which means you can come see a show for free, then head off for drinks, entertainment, food after. It's one of your best downtown nightlife options. I suggest keeping that in your back pocket. So you can replace any night of the week. And if you're looking for a nightlife downtown, it's probably going to be your best option. So keep it in mind. Now, we're slowly taking the river out to Lake Michigan here, which is the way it used to flow. In fact, when we first got here, the Chicago River was only two feet deep and four feet wide. Again, it flowed this way. Nowadays, it's 15 to 20 feet deep, 100 feet wide, and it flows the opposite direction. Like a lot of Uzzies back in the day, we unfortunately used the Chicago River as a sewage system. Pumped our sewage in, that got carried out to Lake Michigan, which is also where our clean drinking supply is. So we were literally poisoning our own water. And on top of that, parts of the water were so polluted that during the Great Chicago Fire, parts of the river caught fire too. So we knew we had to do something about that. And in the year 1892, we began an eight year process of digging canals, building locks that expanded the river, connected us to the Mississippi, and effectively reversed the flow of the main branch here by digging down and using gravity. So since the year 1900, you could take a boat from Lake Michigan all the way to the Gulf, never have to fight the current, we drain down. And this recent investment in our river walk means more invested in the river's health and safety too. In fact, we want this river swimmable by 20... It's also a terrible idea. Please don't swim in our river, come 2030. But that does mean we're not just pumping pollution down the Mississippi and making it St. Louis's problem, which is the main thing we're trying to avoid in all of this, to be honest. Now to the left here, we got a brick building, clock tower on it, the Reed Murdoch. Supposedly, the most haunted building in downtown. So it was used as a makeshift hospital in the worst boat crash in Great Lakes history. Happened right where we are right now. Notice how I saved that till now. Imagine that in the first five minutes. Yeah, it's a different tour. It was the SS Eastland disaster, 1915, well over 100 years ago. Boat's safe for now, don't worry. The Titanic had happened just three years before. We knew we had to make boats safer, did not have to do that safely just yet. At the last minute, we threw a bunch of lifeboats on, only on one side, which ironically made the Eastland top heavy. When over 2,000 people on board rushed to the side to wave goodbye, the whole boat flipped over. Had a casualty rate worse than the Great Chicago Fire, actually, part of the reason that building is still considered haunted to this day. But keep in mind, that was well over 100 years ago, and even back then, he needed over 2,000 people on board a boat to flip it. Now we look packed, but we're still about 1,930 people shy. We'll be okay with that. Don't worry, I promise. Now in just a moment, another cool backstory behind another uh, very cool building in our skyline. This next building was created in Prohibition, when alcohol was technically illegal. And I say technically, because thanks to Al Capone and some other bootleggers here in Chicago around that time, we kind of drank our way through Prohibition as a whole. So in order to prove that, when the Carbon and Carbon building was commissioned built during Prohibition, Burnham and Sons had a good laugh about it, and they decided as a protest to Prohibition, while it was still happening, they designed their building to look like a giant champagne bottle. Can you see the champagne bottle in front of us? It's got green terracotta, black marble, which gives it a green tint, and that's actual real gold on top. That's 24 karat. It's just not thick. It's one five thousandth of an inch, which is half the thickness of saran wrap for comparison. But it is real. And just a few years ago, Carbon and Carbon opened up a new rooftop bar. So if you want a new view of the skyline, you can get it there from the Carbon and Carbon pretty easy. Not a lot of people know about it yet, so reservations day of aren't too big of an issue. Also, a few blocks to the south is Cindy's, a great rooftop restaurant overlooks Grant Park. And a block to the north is the London House. Hey Vince, how's it going? 
How's it going? That's Vince, one of our locals here. Welcoming you all to the city. Uh, now, on the opposite side of this bridge, again, you'll see the London House, which was ranked number two rooftop bar in America. Got yeah, a few years ago. Might be worth checking into. So this tan one in front of us is attached to three others. For this on the left is the London House. And these four buildings all sandwiched together, very common sight in most modern cities. But in Chicago, not how we like to do things. By comparison to the right, you see the amount of space our river walk gives us. Or, to the left, the amount of space we usually keep in between and around our buildings, instead of jamming them all together. We're very intentional to leave and cultivate space here. Again, it's built into the framework of the Burnham plan. If you remember the effect of that, there's no agenda behind space. It allows room for you to exist as you are. Which means, if you have enough space as a city, you don't feel like you gotta walk at a certain pace in order to keep up. If you feel more laid back here in Chicago than other major cities, that's the end result of all this space we got built in. So while you're here, and the sun's out, on a beautiful day like today, take advantage of these spaces. Walk along the river walk or lakefront trip, explore our parks. If you notice our spaces, you also may notice how they make you feel. A lot more open, free, clear, and less claustrophobic than other major cities I'm sure you visited. <coughs> New York. <coughs> <coughs> One of the main uh, perks of living here in Chicago. In front of us again, the Wrigley Building. Named after William Wrigley Jr., Sam benefactor of Wrigley Field, Wrigley Villa up north of the Cubs play. But Wrigley here started his business in this building as a cleaning supply company. Now, when he sent out his cleaning supplies, he'd send complimentary pieces of gum with them. And thank you for choosing us. That gum was so good, no one cared about the cleaning supplies, and eventually he just became a chewing gum company. So if you ever had big red or juicy fruit, that's Wrigley's. He started right there selling soap. Kind of an interesting business move, but it worked out great. And beyond that's the French Gothic Revivalist style of the Tribune Tower. Decade way of the French Gothic Revivalist style, by the way, is the flying buttresses at the top, the archways of the gap. I love a big buttress, and I love it. But, as beautiful as this building is, it's actually built that way. This was the end result of a competition to see who could create the most beautiful office building in the world. We got over 260 entries from 23 different countries, and that was the winning design. To pay tribute to that, around the base are stones from iconic locations all around the world. There are bricks of the Pyramids of Giza, the Great Wall of China, the Taj Mahal, the Parthenon, the Alamo, the Berlin Wall. Even for a period of time, we had a fragment of the moon gifted to us by Buzz Aldrin himself. The moon rock went back to NASA, but the rest of the stones and plenty of others are still there. So, even after the tour, if you take a real quick walk around the outside of the Tribune Tower, you can take a mini free trip around the world. It's another cool free thing to do. And the apple store on the left, where our first settler, Jean-Baptiste Pointe du Sable, a French Haitian man of African descent, set up shop and established the backbone of our fur trading industry. So that's not just where the tour begins, that's also where the city begins too. It's kind of serendipitous in that way. And for a very quick window of time, between the Fidelity Zeller Realty Building and the University of Chicago Center on the left, where the Southern Shoreline boat is, we're going to get a quick glimpse of the Hancock Building, which is where the 360 Signature Room and Signature Lounge is located. You're looking for a black building, white antenna on top. It's our fifth tallest, 13 blocks north of the magnificent mile from where we are now and where we end the tour. So if you're doing a shopping, it's a logical stop. Right there for a very quick window of time. And that's the Hancock Building. And if you walk two blocks north of that, you're standing on Oak Street Beach, one of our best public beaches. It is worth mentioning, Lake Michigan, freezing cold year round. It only feels good unless you're well over 100 degrees. So again, not good for a dip, but good for a tan if you want to get one of those going while you're here in Chicago. And across the river, we got my favorite building coming into view in just a moment. It's going to be in the second row beyond the James Hardy building. What you're looking for is a glass building, different white wavelengths and balconies, all different cuts, lengths, sizes. No two look the same. That is Aqua Tower. Geological contextualism. It's not just paying tribute to the neighboring buildings, but the geological features of this neighborhood. If you stand directly at the base of Aqua, look up, those different balconies all come together to look like ripples or waves across the lake or the river, right next door. In my opinion, it's one of the coolest buildings to go. Back when it was built 2009, that was the tallest structure in the world by a female architect. And her studio game. In 2019, she won the world's most influential architect award. We love to claim her here in Chicago. Now, unfortunately, Aqua doesn't hold the record anymore. But it is for a great reason. 
because Dini Gang destroyed her own record just a few blocks away with the same Regis. This brand new glass building going up in three parts, our third tallest structure, and tallest structure in the world by a female architect to this day. And again, it's so big, right off the lake, it's got three different methods of sway reduction all working together in a single building. If you got a keen eye, you may notice, it's a bundled tube design, same as this year's talent. Going up in those three obvious structures, with this an extra two at the base, including a parking garage, that all bundle together and make it especially secure. Inside, it also has inertial slosh dampers. The water in those concrete tanks that provides a counterbalance to the sway of the wind. Now, when she was designing it, those are the only two methods of sway reduction Genie Gang was going to use. Until they actually built it and realized even with those two methods working together, over 50% of people inside would still get nauseous or scared every time a gust of wind came by. That's how much wind we get. So, had to resort to the third method of sway reduction, which is all the way up on the 83rd and 84th floors. If you look past the glare, you might be able to tell. There aren't any floors. It kind of looks unfinished. Those are the blow-through floors. It's a spot specifically designed to have the wind blow through the building. It breaks up and decreases the overall acceleration of the wind. It's a wind diffuser. It's a very significant way to cut back your sway. You just don't see it often, because it's expensive. To give you an idea, last year, 71st and 72nd floors sold for over $20 million. So, imagine the loss of real estate when you set aside those two floors instead, just to let the wind blow through. You're missing out on millions, tens of millions. But very necessary if you want more than half the population to be able to go inside your building. Gives you an idea of just how much lake effect when we're dealing with. It's like earthquake proofing your buildings on the west coast. It's our main structural difficulty here in Chicago. And again, if you... The original was 68 feet taller than this one. The cars like this could fit 8 to 10 people. But the original could fit up to 60 in each car. And cars the sizes of buses. So as you can imagine, if you think about that, it would be 18 miles. When she came back, five people still didn't trust it. So you had to serve free drinks outside the Ferris wheel so people would loosen up. And in true Chicago fashion, only then did it catch on to the attraction that it is today. Other first of that World's Fair was the first can of Pabst Blue Ribbon. It was just Pabst Beer before then. Got its Blue Ribbon at the World's Fair. It was also the first can of spray paint, the first Cracker Jack, the zipper, the incandescent light bulb, and America's first serial killer. So, bit of a mixed bag, but influential in a lot of different ways. Undeniably, all right here in Chicago, 1893. And on the opposite side of DuSable Lakeshore Drive, you'll see the rest of the Navy Pier. Open 1916 as Municipal Pier 2, which is weird because we've never had a Municipal Pier 1. So, we changed the name after World War I to honor our armed forces and train part of our actual Navy out there during World War II, including future President George H.W. Bush. Now, if a pilot was ever shaky about a landing on an aircraft carrier during those training exercises, no worries. He'd just eject, let his airplane crash in the lake. To this day, still have over 200 sunken airplanes in Lake Michigan from those training exercises. If you're scuba certified, you do tours. You can go out and see them yourself. Or on a name of good visibility, not many clouds. Like today, you might be able to see them. Sometimes you can still catch glimpses out the lake facing side of the Hancock building of some of those sunken airplanes. Yeah. Part of the reason I really like that view from the 360. Another really good view of the skyline could be from the Ferris wheel here. It's $18 to ride it all the way around. And up charge the original 50 cents. Also, no free drinks. But what are you gonna do? And worth mentioning, best view of the skyline is perfectly free anyway. It's around the outside of the Adler Planetarium Museum campus. As we head out, you may look across those boats, see that dome shape out there. That's the Adler. Now, you don't need tickets to go into the Adler Planetarium. It's just around the peninsula out there. If you look back at the city, every building you're looking for in one nice condensed skyline shot. It's just uh, colder than the rest of the city because there's nothing to protect you from the wind. So, plan accordingly. But on a day like today, it feels kind of nice. But if you do want to save yourself the trek or the $18 Ferris wheel fee, we got a final third solution for you. We're taking our final U-turn of the tour here in the Turning Basin. As we do, the skyline's going to be on the side and in front of the boat. It's an opportunity on the tour here to snag any skyline photos you want. It's going to your trip to the city and our wonderful afternoon together.
It's also going to be our last call for the restrooms downstairs or Ray at the bar. If you need either before the end of the tour, now's the time. I'll be around again to answer any questions you may have. So we'll uh, snag some photos, answer some questions, and in just a moment, finish out the tail end of our tour. There's still a little bit more to come, so stay tuned. get back to it. Now I want to give you one last bit of information that uh, most Chicagoans don't even realize. This is not the original shoreline of the lake. The original shoreline used to go all the way up to Michigan Ave, where we start and end the tour. That's why it's called that, because the shoreline of Lake Michigan. So if you know the mental math, you may be wondering, where did all the land around us come from then? After the Great Chicago Fire of 1871, we had all this debris and rubble we didn't know what to do with. So we pushed it out into Lake Michigan and built on top of it. Museum campus, Grant Park, neighbor to the left and right of the boat. A lot of that is debris and rubble from the Great Chicago Fire. So again, we took that travesty, would have taken down any other city. Instead, used it as an opportunity to build more Chicago. It's just the Chicago way. However, that also created an opportunity for some of our stranger characters to take advantage. The neighbor on the right is called Schreederville, named after George Cap Schreeder. He was a gun runner who shipwrecked his boat there in the 1880s. When the city disposed of their debris and rubble, created this new landmass, people came to the area looking to buy it. He would go on his boat, forge a land deed, sell them the land he did not own. He called it the U.S. Independent District of Lake Michigan, and he called himself the mayor. All sounds great. None of that's true. It's all very illegal. And the person who actually owned the land wasn't happy he was selling it. So police caught on, came to the area to break up those land fraud schemes. Streeter fought the police off with bird shot from his shotgun, and boiling pots of water that his wife would chuck from their boat. Now, since neither are technically lethal, even after all that, they couldn't charge him with anything. The thing that eventually brought this man down all the way in 1921 was pneumonia. And the mayor of Chicago showed him at his funeral just to make sure he was actually dead. Now, they say crime doesn't pay, but we named a whole neighborhood after that guy, so what do they know? And if that's not enough, in the heart of the neighborhood, there is still a statue to memorialize him. I'll save you a trip. He looks like Mr. Monopoly, one of our weirdest characters, but shaped the whole area into what it is today, so got a shout out, I think. Also got some housekeeping things to shout out before the end of the tour. First and foremost, if you're not seated, please find your way to a seat and remain in it until the end of the tour. For your own safety, our doctor procedure is jarring, so our captain will explicitly hop on the mic, let you know when it's safe to stay up and exit. Until then, please remain seated. Also, take a look around, make sure you got all your personal belongings, children, Anything that you came with, but I make sure you're leaving with too. How's it going, Andre? Thank you, man. Appreciate you. That's Andre on, one of our locals. Welcome you all to the city. He accepts donations if you come back in the area. You can help him by a sandwich or another bubble gun. Uh, now again. <laughs> also, at the base of that ramp on the way out, if you do have any trash, there will be a trash can. You deposit it there. Help us keep this boat nice and clean. And I'll be waiting for it at the time of those stairs. So if you have any other suggestions, directions, tips, or tricks, I'd be happy to share them with you. Come find me. Or if you have anything like that to share with me, I'm also able and happy to accept it there too. And any appreciation is always appreciated. You know, consistently, in the last eight years, TripAdvisor has rated us one of the top ten tour experiences in the world. This one year, we're number two to just the Vatican. It's me and Pope Francis, neck and neck out here. It's crazy to think about. You guys enjoyed your tour? A TripAdvisor Yelp Facebook group always helps out, especially with the name on it. Let's my bosses know not to fire me and my co-workers here not to mess with me. If you enjoyed your tour, my name was Jack, as in Jack of all trades. If you didn't, Elizabeth, as in not my name. But I hope you guys feel you got more than your money's worth. We go for edutainment. Sweet spot between education and entertainment. Hope that's true of your experience. Because we learned a lot about Chicago. The innovative architecture behind a lot of these buildings that catch your eye, and several styles throughout history. A lot of Chicago's different historical characters and events that have shaped us into who we are today. But most importantly, in my opinion, you guys learned everything you need to fit in with the locals here. What to eat, see, do, drink, how to use public transportation, where the nightlife is, the neighborhoods to visit, what to call the Sears Tower. The only thing left to do is to upgrade you guys from Chicago into training to the real deal. So, by the power vested in me as a shoreline dose of Chicagoan, I hereby proclaim all of you guys on board as honorary Chicagoans yourselves. Go forth, spread the good news of shoreline sightseeing, myself, Jack the Docent, and of course, our wonderful city, my home, Chicago. Welcome, guys. Hope you enjoy.
Thank you guys. Now again, if you're not seated, please sit down until our captain lets you know that it's safe to stand up and exit. Everybody, please find a seat. Take that look around. Make sure you got your personal belongings with you and take them with you. Again, uh, I'll be waiting for you at the top of those stairs. So if you do have any other suggestions, directions, tips, or tricks you need, come find me. I can help you out or accept anything you may have for me there too. I want to thank you one last time for staying with us, spending your Thursday at Shoreline. We appreciate that. If you need anything else, see the top of those stairs in just a moment.